We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and that was Suzuka. Um, and it was, I think it was an interesting race. It, I, 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 I enjoyed it. I thought we had a lot, a lot of like good battles in the midfield, but considering say Emily's location and the timing of the race, it, I would it qualify was... this as a record watch later race, not watch at, you know, two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I bad. mean, it was, it was only the, the race started at 11 for me. And then there was the red flag. The red flag didn't help. No, the red flag did not help my situation no, at all. Not. I mean, it was not as bad as the red flag we had in Suzuka two years ago, but definitely still not great. Not. God, that was not. that whole thing was just a nightmare. Honestly, when the red flag came out, I was like, mm, "It's Suzuka two years ago. I'm going to be up you until know. four o'clock in the morning." <laughs> yeah, but no, it wasn't bad. I mean, it started it started at midnight, but it actually restarted at like. 45 and I was like cool cool love yeah. this for me yeah and before we dive into everything I do want to add I forgot to put this in the rundown but the pre-show and Bernie Collins's contribution to the pre-show was fantastic I think she absolutely like I am a huge Bernie Collins fan this podcast is a huge Bernie Collins fan we love um Bernie. I loved, she did this segment breaking down the tires that everybody had and, you know, she really went like in deep into tire strategy in a way that was like actually really interesting. And also the fact that like they, she was back in the UK in the Sky Studio. She wasn't actually in Japan. So she was, you know, up at one o'clock in the morning for her call time. Um, But I thought that everything that she did in, in studio this weekend was fantastic. We only have 10 races with her this season, but we we need to have 24 races with her every season because she's so good she is and I really appreciate like her point of view on things because like she's worked as a strategist for so long she really mm-hmm. understands it and she can put it in I wouldn't say a hundred percent layman's terms like a third grader may not be able to process it super easily but she puts it in a way that's like digestible super yeah. easily yeah, exactly. And then, like, during the red flag, she was, like, really quickly doing some sort of math to figure out, like, the fuel loads and how much it would take to, you know, burn off the extra fuel because of the red flag and the laps mm-hmm. that the, the, the teams lost. And I would just, like, that was – I thought that was really, really cool. Um, yeah. And I want more of that, please. Yeah. No, we like her. We love Bernie. We love Bernie Weekends. Yeah, so. Bernie Weekends. She kind of made up for the, the Bradley of it all. Because it was a Bradley yes, weekend. Yes, it, it was a Bradley Lord weekend. He is not our favorite team representative to be on the Sky broadcast. Um, he actually, I will, I will give him credit. You, you were, you were asleep for this, but he was actually pretty good in FP two, um, FP, in which FP two was so boring because nobody drove because it was wet but not wet enough, um, and then it wasn't very dry, and so there were like basically it was just chatting. So when Crofty was asking um, Bradley about like what conversations he was having with Lewis during the the waiting period. That was actually kind of interesting instead yeah. of the the usual like he's he's very dry um, and you know very technical, but not in the same way that like a James Vowles would be. Um, so he he had a couple decent moments, but for the most part, it was like I I kind of just like tuned out when he would you know ramble. Yeah. Oh, I'm just waiting for my next James Bell's weekend. I know. Who knows? I know. Maybe, Maybe it'll be China. We'll it in China. Are we I racing mean, I, in China? I still don't believe we are. <laughs> I, I, I've never I been a conspiracy we'll theorist, but China makes me reconsider. <laughs> Yeah, it'll it'll be really like like everybody flies in and the Chinese government's like nothing this ain't happening. I think that would be really interesting. But I'm also really excited for if if slash when this does happen, like Zhou Guanyu's fashion, he's gonna have a he had better have a home race helmet. Hopefully, he will actually complete the race instead of yeah. DNFing uh, like he did this week because his car is you know a sauber. Um, but I I'm really very interested to see what China is going to be like in two weeks. 
I know. I'm pumped. I feel like it'll be a really big deal because we haven't raced there in so long. Like, the last <laughs> winner was Lewis Hamilton. Um, so that should tell you how long it's been since we've raced in China. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for the fashion too. I feel like we just get more out of the drivers in Asia when it comes to like their race day fits. Yeah. It's not a game day fit. Um, we're just going to go with that. Um, it was a little disappointing in Japan. Not going to lie. I thought we would have a little bit more. The fans turned out. I feel like it was very subdued from the drivers. Yeah. Oh, I, I've said it before. I will say it again. I will keep saying it until the cows come home. The Japanese fans at the Japanese Grand Prix any are other. next level. They're next so level. Great. I yeah. love how they all have like multiple outfits. They go all out. Like they're just there. They they just it's such a niche thing there too. I feel like yeah. Like I don't I don't feel like every other team or not every other race has something like this. Like it's very you know, iconic to Japan. It it, it really is. And I, I think it it's, they just, when they, like when people in Japan, when they love something, they really go all into it. Like they just, they love Formula One. They're such great fans. It's just like at a whole other level, the hospitality in Suzuka. Yeah. No, I, I think after watching one, because I don't think I can watch this race outside of Japan one more year because it's so hard for me to watch this race. But I think I've added this to the list of races that I absolutely have to go to. Oh, 100%. Especially if they keep it in April in the cherry blossom season. Like everybody was just like obsessing over the cherry blossoms the entire day. It was so nice. Yeah. I know. Oh, love, love, love. Also, this is super random, but I love being back in America because we don't have a delay anymore and we can actually have full-on conversations rather than us having to wait for like five seconds to talk to each other. I yeah. feel like we're going to be on such a like good trajectory and I'm going to go home and it's going to be like, can you hear me? Are you there? Yeah. Hello? It's, it's, it's me listening to my own echo again, waiting for <sighs> me to, to, to finish saying on your end. It's yeah. so bad. It is so bad. But anyways, Ooh, should we get into our recap of the weekend? Yeah. So um, as I predicted, the Max Verstappen Revenge Tour, check. Was uh, there. Yep, he he rebounded from that that DNF, uh, which was of course a mechanical DNF, um, in Australia to win by twelve whole seconds. That's such a Red Bull thing to say. Like it was not his fault. It was a mechanical DNF. <laughs> Do not blame the driver. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me you're a Red Bull fan without telling me you're a Red Bull fan, Catherine. I mean that's true. No, um, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It it was a very unfortunate DNF, and it you know ruined his streak of things and it's a buzzkill but you know he came back he won yeah well and then another reason why he he said that he won is that you know his partner kelly her daughter penelope was seeing him race for the first time in australia and was like well what happened to the car and he's like well it kind of caught fire so max was like i basically i had to win this race or penelope was gonna um think that she was the cause to to his lack of performance I have never loved a relationship in any aspect of my life more than I love Max and Penelope. They're the cutest. And then hearing as the anthem started, yay, Maxi, yay, Maxi, was the best thing. I was like, oh my God, that's got to be Penelope. And then I saw a video on Instagram of, and of her like, and it was her. She's like, oh, hi. Love her. Love Kelly too. Yeah. I think Kelly's a great mom. I don't know her. I know nothing about her, but she seems like she's a great mom. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 fun. We we obviously don't talk a lot about the the driver's personal relationships, but we all know why. Um, Max and Kelly and Penelope is one of my most funniest um, driver relationship because oh, yeah. Penelope's father is Daniel Kvyat. Um, but yeah, it's they're it, they're just they're adorable um and yeah max uh, max has proven that it was not penelope's fault <laughs> no no so yeah he killed it i mean red bull just had a good weekend all around because checo ended up p2 he actually had a good qualifying a really good qualifying um yeah which it's funny that we say that because this time last year he was what winning races and qualifying p2 yeah um and doing really, really well. And then he kind of, like, hit a decline, I'd say, like, after Miami. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, right after. And so, yeah, he kind of turned it around. He qualified 
very, very sliver behind Max, had a good race. No notes. Good yeah, job. I, I, but I also, I haven't had a chance to look it up, but I, I'm pretty sure this is one of his closest um, margins between him and Max in a very long time. Because oh, yeah. yes, there were, you know, 2022 season, early portion of last season where he was qualifying, you know, right behind Max, but not in, you know, less of a 10th of a margin. Um, so that mm-hmm. was, that that is, you know, good for the fact that Checo could potentially be looking for a seat next year. I saw a report somewhere that he he said that he should know within the next month what his future with Red Bull is going to look like. Um was it that he will or that he wants to? Uh, I think it's I think it's will. Okay. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like they'll just keep him. I, f- I feel like that's the trajectory that they're on right now, especially with his performance to start the season. Red Bull has had three one twos in four races yeah. um, and two constructors have given four um, one twos for the first time in the history of Formula One, which is just absolutely ban- bananas. Well, and I'm going to say to everybody take this with a grain of salt, but I feel like Red Bull looks at Checo and they say he's improving. He's doing better. He's also a good little soldier who will just fall in line and Max will be number one. He's our second driver. He'll listen to anything we tell him because he's a good little soldier. And when I say that, I say that with the fact and knowing that every single post he posts on social media is clearly a team order and he has, he has zero voice. Um, And again, that's why I'm not a huge fan, but I feel like Red Bull will just keep him around, around because it's the easiest path to success for Max. If well, they bring well, yeah. in someone super competitive who's actually going to challenge him truly, that's not good for Max. And Max is the golden child. So I feel like that's what, a, a huge reason why they'll keep Checo. Well, well, exactly. One of the things that, you know, Red Bull understands that Max Verstappen, three-time world champion, is their guy. And that this, the other driver needs to understand that Max is the guy. And that was, you know, when you think about Danny Ricardo, he left Red Bull because Max was the guy. And he felt that he wasn't getting enough, you know, respect, acknowledgement, whatever, what have you, um, which led him on the, the the trail of terrible no good career decisions um but it's you know that is you know obviously a good driver is a factor but also you know to be able to live with the fact that max is going to be ahead of you yeah. is another big factor and like yes we would all love to see carlo signs in a red bull race suit again but will that actually work out no i don't know i mean yes it, i don't know Ooh, I don't know. Because Carlos is driving, like, okay, well, Carlos ended up on the podium, so he was P3, which yeah, maybe that's not great. But, again, the man had his appendix out, like, a month ago. Let's yeah. just, you know, t- put that out there. But also he's out driving Charles Leclerc, who they gave him a monstrous contract, and they told Carlos, you're not good enough to stay on this team, and we want Lewis Hamilton, who – what was p9 has not done well at all this season dnf last week in australia so carlos is driving some of his it's some of the best driving of his career i also don't hate the idea of him going back to red bull and really challenging max and pushing max because as long as they're pushing and getting p1 p2 every single weekend they're gonna win constructors and between the two of them you know one would win driver world champion as long as red bull keeps up with their engineering in their car right i mean do i think it's gonna happen no but like i said in our last podcast he's from that red bull family he was on toro rosso like maybe he gets yeah i put his hat in the ring I, I definitely, you know, think that a lot of teams have a lot of very hard decisions to make um, going into silly season, which might be in May this year because uh, there and there, there's been a rumor um, that I think was credited to, credited to Will Buxton, who's in the the paddock all the time. He's that guy on Drive to Survive who has like the really obvious comments. Um, and I think he said that there's going to be a, a major driver contract announcement within the next few weeks. I. Uh... I hope it's not Checo or not um, Carlos going to Mercedes. I don't think it's going to be that. Everyone keeps posting shit about Senior and Toto and Carlos chatting and 
Oh, I don't like Yos it. Yos Verstappen and Toto were chatting, so. Yeah, well, whatever. Yos, I don't take anything Yos does. Nothing. No, nothing. Yos is just. Yes, it's just yes. Um, but moral of this story: Carlos had a really good weekend. Ferrari yeah. did not screw him over. Thank yeah. goodness they actually told Carlo or um, Charles, like, "Hey, let Carlos through our fights with Lando. It's not for the podium." Carlos yeah, well, questioned he- it. He was like, "Hey, am I fighting or like well, what's going on here?" And they're like, "Yes, we're going for the podium." Yeah, Carlos very much w- said that. Like he he made that radio call just to be like, "Look." I'm going to take this podium from Charles. You can't stop me. Plus, he also knew that, you know, tire strategy-wise, Charles was on much older tires, and there was, you know, there was not going to be any way that Charles was going to be able to hold him off or that we would have had a similar battle like at Monza last year, which terrified and traumatized the hearts of many a Tifosi. (laughs) And those who are not in Monza, (laughs) just watching and observing. Yeah. I don't think I breathed the entire race. It was very stressful. So before we move on to um, who else impressed, um, I do want to add in the Max Verstappen record book portion um, (laughs) that um, during his revenge tour in Suzuka, um, he surpassed 3,000 laps led. He is now the fourth Formula One driver in the history of the sport to lead more than 3,000 laps, joining Lewis Hamilton, who has not led a lap in a while, but he's got 5,455. Michael Schumacher, who's got 5,100. And 11, and then of course our favorite Sebastian Vettel with 3,501. Hamilton has led so many laps. That's like that really goes to show just how dominant Mercedes was from that stretch of, of eight constructors' championships. Is that Lewis was not only was he ahead, but he was so far ahead of so much of the grid. Well, but also like it goes to show how good Max is because Max is only what 2,500 ish laps behind. Yeah. And Hamilton's been doing this a lot longer than he has. So, yeah. So it will it, probably it, eclipse the 5,000 faster than Hamilton did. I, I would think so too. And, you know, Max is the third winningest driver in the history of Formula One. Um, Lewis has 103, and that's the most. Um, I don't remember what Schumacher's number is, but it, it is Schumacher in, in, in second. So it'll be interesting to see how quickly Max, you know, moves through those rankings. Of course, you know, he might retire at the end of his contract, but um, until then, he's going to be winning a lot of races. Wild. Um, I'm surprised we don't, well, I'm not surprised. It makes sense that Fernando Alonso hasn't, you know, been included in that club, but it's, you know, one less way we can sit age Fernando Alonso. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's been around a minute. Um, uh, he drove pretty well this weekend. Yeah. I was actually really impressed with him, especially because he had, um, less experience in the car with the upgrades that they put on. Yeah. Um, and he managed to qualify really well. He fought really hard to maintain that P6. He took a page out of Carlos Sainz's book from Singapore with the DRS trick that Carlos and Lando used to hold off the Mercedes, um, uh, Fernando used it with Oscar Piastri who Oscar did not manage to hold off George, but Fernando did. Um, and I, I thought it was, it was a really impressive drive from him. And it, it was, you know, I, I think that Aston Martin is sneaking its way into, you know, move, moving up the midfield. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, between Aston Martin and uh, McLaren, I feel like they are really pushing each other to do better. Yeah. And, 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 you know, get out of that midfield pack. So yeah, exactly. Good things coming from these upgrades. We all know they're down, they're major downgrade from last season. So hopefully, um, you know, they can keep improving, keep pushing. Yeah, exactly. Also our little Yuki got points. Yeah. His home race. It's so exciting. Um, yeah. It's the first time he scored points in his home race. Yeah, ever. He he has typically not performed the best in Suzuka. Obviously, if you're not, you know, scoring points, you're not in the top 10. Um, but, and I think he might have even DNF'd at least one of those races. Um, but yeah, he's the first Japanese driver since Kimi uh, Kobayashi, who finished third in Japan in 2012, to finish with in the points at their home race in Japan. Yeah. 
Um, also, it's so funny to me. Again, I know I've mentioned this a thousand times, but for us to be like, oh, yeah, it's the first time he's ever scored points in his home race. I'm like, well, it's only like his second home race. <laughs> but I'm like, he's, no, he, he's not. He's been here for a while. I don't know why, but I can't. I think it's just because he's so little and so cute. Yeah, he just, he, we, we talked about like, he just feels like a rookie still, even though he's yeah. very experienced in Formula One and is finally in this season showing off that experience. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that I want to point out with Yuki that I, I kind of didn't realize was actually something really interesting um, until the pre show last night was um, he was um, being interviewed by Ted Kravitz for Sky and pointed out that Honda is going to be leaving the Red Bull family and joining Aston Martin in 2026. Um, and so the question is, will Yuki stay with Red Bull or will he, as a Honda driver who is, his contract is being paid out by Honda, he's not, you know, being paid by Visa Cash App RB. So will he go or will he stay? Well, first of all, this has Daddy Stroll written all over it of all like, forth. oh, Red Bull's good. I'll just, you know, take their engine, take their engine. Um, God, I don't know. And I, I, okay, here's the thing. I think it's good. It would have taken a lot for Honda to leave Red Bull and join Aston Martin, right? Because they're winning. They're doing amazing things. Like, why, why would you leave? I think Lawrence threw a lot of money at at them and I think with that he has to bring Yuki I don't yeah think, I don't I don't think well especially like with Liam Lawson being around I could see them bringing him up but I mean it's going to depend on how Danny does so maybe they keep Yuki in you know v-carb but I I don't know. I think Honda wants a competitive Japanese driver and Yuki has shown he can outdrive the car. He's out driving Daniel every single weekend. He's doing really well. Um, I, I don't, that's, it's super interesting because then you look at Aston Martin, it's like, well, who's getting the boot? You're not going to kick out unless Lance goes to like, go play video games and ride his, <laughs> his bicycle all over the world. But I don't think daddy's going to be very happy about that. And hey, the rumor Daniel, was tennis. Remember? Oh, I forgot. I'm so sorry. It was tennis. <laughs> He'll be playing pickleball before you know it. Um, or paddle, whatever they play. But I don't see Fernando Alonso leaving either because I think he's really enjoying his time there. And it came out, you know, he said, why would I leave and go to Mercedes when they're doing worse than we are? Like, I'm, that's not looking attractive. So unless they actually kick Fernando to the curb, which I don't think they will, because I think him and Lawrence have like this weird father-son relationship. Um I don't know. Like I could, I can see it happening, but I just don't know how the other chips will fall. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. That's I like word totally... vomit. I understand. Well, but... well, no, I totally can see it happening. Cause here's the thing. This is not happening until the 2026 season. Um, Fernando is still on the fence of whether he is going to stay in formula one through another, a new um, regulation change. He's, you know, dep- he's going to be there till he dies. Gonna... We know well, that. well, yes, he's going to stay on the grid forever. But the, the thing is, is that, you know, if Fernando, you know, retires or wants to leave, I also, I think that this might be the best chance for Yuki to drive a car that is not a Toro Rosso Alpha Tauri Visa Cash App Red Bull would be to follow Honda, which, you know, in the interview, he was asked, you know, would he go or would he stay with the Red Bull family? And he really didn't like, you know, he demurred. And obviously this wouldn't be anything that would be announced until, you know, midway through the 2025 season at least i don't so believe is... any timelines anymore Catherine. <laughs> okay expect it. you're you're right you're right expected timelines because obviously silly season is an absolute ish show these days kerfuffle. so i it, it is a kerfuffle so i i don't you know there's not a rush on this obviously yuki is out of contract this year with rb as with you know half the grid is out of contract so it could be a another you know a year long a two year contract that would get him to 26 um and then 26 he can go and you know go to Aston Martin with Honda yeah I I honestly think I don't think people appreciate and understand like the company relationships that actually truly affect the driver's seat right like especially Honda Honda is a huge one because Honda has Yuki's contract plain and simple so yeah 
on paper, cut and dry, Honda moving, I see Yuki moving because they have his contract, but he's out of a contract this season. So I don't know. But I, I agree with you. I want to see Yuki in a truly competitive car because I think he's good enough and I think he's relaxed enough now from his rookie years of just being mad and yelling on the radio and crashing. Like, he's had clean drives for, you know, a while now, pending, like, uh, that one mechanical issue that he had. But yeah, he's been doing well. I would like to see him in a more competitive car than V-Carb or uh, Alphatari. Yeah, because, you know, not to, you know, say this in, in a mean way, but I don't think there's any chance at all of him going to Red Bull. I, I no. just don't see no. him going. I, I don't think that is on anyone's radar. You know, what, you know, Helmet Marco can say till the cows come home that he has to, you know, improve to be considered. But I just think that there are so many other better options for the second Red Bull seat that precludes Yuki at a time where, you know, Yuki may or may not want to be at RB forever. Um, and Aston Martin could pose a really interesting challenge, especially if Fernando Alonso is somewhere else. Yeah. And I honestly don't think they give him enough credit, Yuki. Like, well, no, they, they definitely don't. They bring in other people to like lead the team, and he ends up, you know, doing better. And right, sadly, I think they would consider Liam Lawson more seriously for Red Bull than Yuki, which isn't right, but I think that's how it would play out. Yeah, exactly. So, so I'd like I... to see him kind of leave and go somewhere where they, you know, appreciate and cherish him because he's and hopefully trainer. it's not a um alpine situation because oh, God, uh yeah. pierre left looking for a uh, better situation and is not in a better situation right now i'm sure he would rather yeah. take a an rb that is not great compared to what he's got at alpine yeah honestly we could talk for like five hours about seat switches and the musical chairs that will be 2020 yeah so at least I just I just wanted to toss this in just because I you know it I I no, it, it occurred to me last night and it is yeah. vi- and it is a very interesting wrinkle that I don't think is going to impact for for 2025 but could be very impactful for 26 no I think it's a really good point and it's something we should continue to monitor oh and we will um and we are I've also decided... continuing to monitor well before we jump to our like gag of the podcast yeah. um I am putting in a petition to change it from the summer silly season to just May Mayhem because May- it will ma- Mayhem, mayhem. <laughs> um, because it literally it's not going to be over the summer break. Everyone's going to know in May. No, silly season is a a, a year long thing. It's it's like you know how Christmas like has made like the creep earlier and earlier, and it's like it's up to Thanksgiving to hold it off from like taking over you know Halloween. Oh, it's like Labor Day. Like, Get your Christmas tree. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what silly season is becoming. F1 2024 season. The it's silly still- season. The silly season. The- ay ay ay. Um okay, now we can get into the laughing stock of the podcast, which is yeah. Sabers pit stops. <laughs> yes. So um if you don't understand why we're talking about this, you clearly live under a rock. But Sauber has really struggled with their pit stops because of, um, what's it called? The The wheel nut. The wheel nut. Thank you. Um, Something's wrong. And they've had like 15 to 53 second pit stops, but they were more reasonable this time around. Still not great, but they were like under 10 seconds. Yeah. There was a four second pit stop. There was like, they were in like the 48 range, which is awful like if that's like a pit like if that's a red bull pit stop max is going to be like getting out of his car to yell at gp to yell at the mechanics like yeah. it's not good but considering the fastest pit stop that we have seen from Sauber this season before this race was like 13 seconds or we don't even know because you know t- the tv was at a point early on that they just stopped tracking them because they were so long like that's that's where we get the oh they're improving which is what they expected and like like they were even saying during practices that the the pit stops that they had during the practice sessions were going as they are supposed to go. I will say they really only had one car to worry about for a majority Correct. of the race, which yes. probably factored into it. But it's also funny how the presenters on Sky Sports will like 
comment on it. They're like, and in a big surprise, <laughs> Sauber's had a clean pit. <laughs> um, so that's when you know that it's like clearly being monitored across the galaxy. But. Oh, well, everybody is, is, is looking into it. And it's just, you know, TV direction isn't always showing it. But I, I do want to, to piggy, piggyback off on that and say that um, between Crofty and Ted Kravitz and Anthony Davidson, who was in for, for Martin Brundle this week, they were on target with commentary last last race oh. I, they were so so good they they brought in some entertainment that we weren't necessarily getting from the front um to just you know keep us you know focused on what was happening on track no they're so good and like they'll they talk about the r- most random things and have jokes and i'm you know it's three o'clock in the morning for me and i'm laughing um which if you can get me to laugh and half asleep that's you know a win yeah. for me uh, but no, I really enjoyed the the commentary from the presenters this weekend. For sure. Yeah, they were great. So now we've got through the impress and the things that we enjoyed. Let's, Let's talk about who disappointed. <laughs> Starting from turn two. Oh my God. Daniel Ricardo and Alex Albon. Yep. What the F, man? That I mean, was. It was, yeah. So Daniel Ricardo bumped into Alex Albon and they both ended up going into the wall. It was a racing incident. Like, it really did look like a racing incident. Um, You know, checking a mirror, moving over, taking the racing line, whatever you... um, I don't... It's... No one was penalized. It was just... And I don't think anybody should have been. No, I I agree with what the stewards decided, 100%. Yeah, Um, I know that there was a lot of discourse around that while we were waiting for the stewards because the stewards waited until after the race, um, which, not my favorite decision, but I, I, I don't think that you know anybody should have been penalized that track is very narrow it is on those and it goes from wide to narrow super very quickly quickly. yeah i do i would like to just like take a time out and give a hand to the people who rebuilt the barrier so oh my god yeah because i don't remember what race it was last year but we waited around forever for it to be rebuilt god what race was it or maybe it was qualifying i don't remember uh, it was like um it was zanvert it was it was zanvert, uh, after yes. after danny and and um and oscar crashed and danny broke his hand it took forever yes. for them to to fix the um, yes the tire barrier but they like had the cranes out there they were getting everything out of the way and everything was done and everything um also want to point out when everyone heard about the crash they all asked is daniel okay no one yeah. worried about alex what yeah. has Alex done to have the entire grid not care about him? No, yeah, I think- it, yeah, that was because when when Max asked GP, GP responded, "Daniel's okay." Out of he said, Max yeah. said, "Are they okay?" And GP said, and GP goes, "Daniel's, Daniel's out of the car." Okay. <laughs> no, it just like oh my god, I was just. It, but I also don't know if people saw that it was two cars because the two cars do look very similar in color. Mm -hmm. And going so fast, like, and Alex's car was completely buried. So it only looked like it was one car. So I'll give them that little caveat. But um, I just feel bad for poor Alex. He seems like he's such a nice little guy. Or nice little guy. Yeah, but, but no, da- and Daniel was having a decent weekend before before he, he crashed. Like he, you know, yes, he didn't make it out of Q2, but he, you know, was driving much better than he had been um and he, like if watching the replays because they showed the replays about eighty two thousand times he had no grip on those mediums yeah. at all off the line like there was nothing there was for such him a bad start. um and so he was he was doing everything he could to just you know stay on the line that he was on and then he was checking over his shoulder for lance and i loved how um max saw like one replay in the cool down room and was like oh he was looking at lance without even like barely seeing his helmet twitch because i had to be directed on one of the 45 replays and like everybody watch his helmet and watch how he turns his head right before the impact also i loved how this crash happened we were on a red flag and it's like we have nothing else to do but show you a replay from every driver's perspective (laughs) every single one it's like here's from alex here's from daniel and lance was right here and this other person and here was k-max yeah 
Oh, I loved it. Loved it. I loved how I loved how that that section that session of of Red Flag was it was replays from eighteen different angles or Stefano Domenicali and the Japanese princess in the stands in in the fancy people box and like that was all you saw for a good thirty minutes. Yeah, loved it. Loved it. Um, Yeah. So with that being said, I do want to bring up the elephant in the room, which is the Williams chassis. <laughs> the uh, if, And if we want to be specific, the other Williams chassis, because other. this is Logan's chassis that is broken, has been confirmed to have to had to be sent back to the UK. So it is probably at this point at Grove or just reaching Grove by now. Alex has a vendetta against this chassis. That yeah. is, that's what I'm determining. Um, that or he really hates James Bowles and he's like, I'm going to make your life really miserable. Poor yeah, so James. Is, oh my God. Poor James. Right. And poor everyone at Williams. Let's be honest. But yes. No, honestly though, poor Logan. Because yeah. what's going to happen to Logan? <laughs> um, so Logan had to give up his car. Alex took that car. Alex is now driving that car and Alex has now crashed that car. Um, Sergeant does have a repaired chassis in his car. Alex will maybe now have one or does Logan have to sit out of China and Alex takes Logan's car? I think they said that it would be ready for China. Fortunately, like between Australia, Japan, we have two weeks between Japan and China, which is actually kind of interesting considering Japan and China are like neighbors. I mean, I know there's yeah. ocean between them. So I, I thought it was really interesting that there is another two weeks between races. Um, but that said, they're still not going to have an extra you know, tub, bucket, chassis portion until Miami. But the wrinkle is that we're going to China the first sprint race of the year, which means an extra opportunity to crash or be crashed into or damage the car in some way. But here's the thing. And I know like we're not even talking about Japan at this point, but who cares? Um, I do, but we'll get there. So if you're Williams, do you have confidence in Alex still like what happens if something happens in free practice one or the sprint shootout and Alex crashes again do you give him Logan's car or do you say Logan you haven't actually crashed we are gonna let you drive and not let Alex drive because Alex has crashed two you know races in a row yeah I mean he might be leading the destructors championship which if you have not seen on social media that is the estimated tabulations of uh how much damage each driver has caused their cars I think that if Alex crashes in the sprint they will not give the car or crashes it bad enough that it can't be repaired they will not give Logan's car at this point I I think that Alex and obviously like we said no one was at fault for the Ricardo Albon crash but I don't think like at this point that they're going to be willing to face the really bad PR of being like Logan we got to give your car to Alex again if Logan was driving worse maybe but Logan actually has not been I mean he's on par with last year I shouldn't say he's driving amazing but at one point I was like oh Logan's driving well he he might finish P10 P11 he didn't um, cause he drove himself off of the track, but into the you dust, know, you know, I had never seen a car so dusty. Even my own car that I don't wash nearly often enough was less dusty than is, that Williams car. And also this is like, not the first time that he's had to reverse. I think I DM'd you. I was like, he's you did. really working the the reverse on this car because he, I feel like every single race he goes somewhere, has to reverse and then keep going. But yeah. I, I think, I think Williams way- overall just needs a lot of help. Yeah, they they need a couple of miracles, but I think from a from specifically from a Logan standpoint, I do think that he is driving just about on par with how he was driving toward the end of last year. Right. Um so I I so I just, you know, it's just it's just every everything that can go wrong for Williams is going very wrong. I know. And they were looking better towards the end of the season, so that makes me upset. But... Yeah, also that. Um yeah, so it'll, it'll, it'll be, be interesting, interesting to see what happens with those chassis. I think yeah. moral of the story for them is they need three next season from the jump. And from I mean, the they jump. they they did they made a very they made a lot of of technical changes, management changes, everything changes at Williams um, over over the winter break, which is not long and getting shorter every year. So yeah. you know. Th- 
and and Williams, as as we have said, is is typically a a team that improves as the season goes on. And we are only in race four, even though it feels like we've been racing since February when Lewis announced that he was leaving Mercedes. Yeah, we got we're only one sixth through the uh, season. That's wild. wild. But yeah, speaking of Mercedes, yeah, they gambled and lost. Swing and a miss. Yeah, it was the the one stop was a bold choice um and just didn't work and i thought it was very interesting you know lewis qualified p7 george qualified p9 george finished p7 lewis finished p9 yeah i mean but hey let's they both you know dnf'd last last race in australia they both got points again these sneaky points that we always talk about with mercedes every single time every single time they still managed to stay in the points they still managed to score was it worth it probably not for one stop but it is what it is they scored points there yeah. you go and also the one stop was technically a two stop because everybody got a free pit stop after the red flag right. and i think the only i think only like three or four drivers didn't take um actually change their tires during the red right. flag and that was the red bulls and i think lando i don't remember i think you're right on that yeah but. um and george also forced oscar off the track a little bit oscar kept his position this was when they were you know trying when george was trying to you know get it at oscar and and fernando and um he wasn't penalized for it but i don't think that george should have been penalized for for that no. because no. It, it was a net nothing yeah um someone else who kind of like gave nothing this weekend uh lance stroll yeah qualified t- terribly and i don't know because i was like half watching qualifying because it was such a bad time for me but um i personally feel like it was more of a strategy error than his error because i feel like they thought he was in a place where he was high enough and he because he just sat in the pits and then all Mm -hmm. of a sudden he had to like come out and do one last shot or whatever but i think it may have been strategy with qualifying versus him actually driving poorly um because it see because at least that's how I remember it maybe I'm completely wrong and people can rip me apart that's fine but I feel like I sat and watched him in the pit like when he should have been out there and he wasn't yeah yeah it was well the the issue was a lack of tires right um which it it bit Lance, it bit Fernando, and it also bit Charles for qualifying. That's why Charles only did one lap in qualifying and prayed, and it didn't work out very well for him. But yeah, what was really interesting what for for Lance was he had more experience with the new upgrades because they put the upgrades on his car for FP1, and then Fernando got his um, for FP3. So he had more experience with them, but didn't manage to to make that work and he he had a a very very loud shouty radio call that was giving very angry yuki from the days of the we love angry yuki um which was a little bit of a giggle but yeah he was very frustrated and and he managed to limp to p12 but it was not where you know when when your teammate is p6 and it's fernando with an hour you know two hours less experience and with the upgrades that's not a good look well, also when you're trying to, like we were just saying, break out of that mid tier, that's right. not a place where you want to end up. Nope. So. And no team anyone wants to be on is Alpine nope. because once again they sucked. Still really bad. Yeah. I was very surprised with uh, Akon during Quali. Oh, he, he looked good. To, like, well, I don't want to say good. Decent. <laughs> good for alpine decent for the rest of the grid let's clarify um but i was like wow that's really impressive um but yeah so overall they're not going to score this week or this year yeah gasly gasly hit him gasly there were were points gasly was like already a lap down and he was like getting in intermixed involved with other things that were happening um and I, i was just like uh this is um it it's it just it wasn't wasn't great yeah oh wolf well who knows um Mm -hmm. yeah should we get into our predictions now that we've talked around and around and around yes we we had predictions and um thank you checo perez who blew them (laughs) 
Yeah. What the hell, Checo? Why did you take this out on me? Uh, Anyways, so we predicted um, pole podium P10 um, for our scoring for our points. So we both chose the same thing all every long. Um, (laughs) So for pole, we picked Max, which we got. So we each got a point for that. Our podium, we did not get. We did select two of the podium winners um but not in the correct order and we didn't get all three so the podium was max checo carlos we both selected max carlos lando what a disappointment lando i feel like you should have done better yeah Um, mclaren we didn't really talk about mclaren in 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 this but mclaren was really just kind of on the track yeah yeah they they were just there yep nothing to note um and then p10 was yuki in his home race we both picked Stroll. He was P12, so close, but not not quite. Nope. Um, I'm very happy that Yuki got points. I wish he would have gotten more. Like, I hate picking Yuki for P10 because I always want more from him. Yeah. But he's a solid P10 pick. We should have gone with it. Yeah. Um, and then we also do some fun selections that we don't award ourselves points for because these are just off the cuff. Biggest surprise for Catherine was that Daniel was going to have a good weekend. He um, did until he crashed. He did until turn two. Yep. <laughs> um, and then I said that Mercedes is going to come back strong from Australia. Catherine would say no. I would say yes because they both got points, those sneaky points. Um, so we'll we'll say maybe on that one. Yeah. Um, and then for who's going to do a dumb, Catherine nailed said it. Williams. Um, yeah, I would say you nailed it. Logan went into the dust and uh, Alex broke another chassis. So you nailed that one. Um, yep. I said Sauber. Uh, Zhou Guan Yu did have to retire. Um, Botas did drive well, but their pit stops were still very subpar. So I'm going to give myself some credit on this one. Still I, I would I would give it to you as well. You know, Botas did look good. He had some good overtakes. And, you know, Zhou also looked decent. I mean, obviously he didn't qualify well at all, but, you know, his his gearbox gave out. Yeah, and, and to, you know, take a page out of your book, this was a mechanical issue. It was not a driver issue. <laughs> and and to be fair to Joe, most of his DNFs are mechanical are, related. Yeah, yep. Yeah, no, 100%. All right, so if you are keeping track along with us, Catherine has 12 points and I have three, but things can change very quickly. Catherine only got one podium and, you know, she leached ahead, so. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Um, final thoughts. I'm obsessed with Suzuka in springtime. I love the uh, Japanese pear blossoms. It was so pretty. I think it's a great time of year. The fans were amazing. It was just a, you know, record and watch in the morning race for me, though. Overall. Yeah, yeah, it was it, it was a it was it was a solid race. I, I was entertained. I think that the broadcasters really helped make it, you know, a race to Keep, to stay engaged um especially you know so late at night even though it was, obviously it was a lot later for you than it was for me um but i just i'm obsessed with suzuka it's a bucket list race gotta go i need to i need to put it onto my bucket list i think yeah. every every single one's a bucket list one for me at this point but i mean right we should do that we should pick our five races that we want to go to i bet we'll pick the same ones just knowing us but yeah exactly All right, Kevin, do you have an F1 fun fact for us? I do. I have a Japanese Grand Prix-based Japanese uh, driver uh, fun fact, and it is um, three drivers. um, Three Japanese drivers have finished on the podium, and twice it has happened in Japan. Um, Aguri Suzuki, he podiumed in Japan in 1990. Uh, Takuma Sato, who was at the race, he podiumed in um, the U.S. in 2004. And Kobayashi, as we said earlier, he podiumed in uh, Japan in 2012. And that was the last Japanese driver to score points in Japan. There you go. That's our F1 fun fact. So, holy podcast. I feel like we've been talking for two hours. Um, but up next, we will have China, maybe. I'm still not convinced. But the next race is China. It's our first sprint weekend. Mm-hmm. Ah, it's the first one with the new format. 
you know Catherine and I will have a thousand and one opinions that you don't care about, but we will tell you anyways about how much we don't like sprint weekends. Yep. But for the podcast next week, we will have another F101. So F101 is our more educational series that we do about different topics, different things around the sport. We are going to do a deep dive into the Young Driver program. So you guys can look out for that next week. That has been it for our Suzuka Japanese Grand Prix recap. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.